Well, good morning and welcome everyone uh, to our Welcoming Week 2020 Interfaith Prayer Service, uh, which is something that we are so grateful and appreciative to the United Church of Christ for continuing to be a leader in terms of bringing us all together. We give thanks here at Global Cleveland, in the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, Northeast Ohio, and we welcome our presenters for this Welcoming Week Interfaith Worship Service, which has always been the way that we begin this important week. Over 50 cities across the United States at this moment are participating in Welcoming Week, where we embrace the stranger, where we comfort the afflicted, and where we say to our sisters and brothers who come from nations all around the world, welcome home, welcome to these United States, and welcome to our community. It is right and it is fitting that the United Church of Christ, which is one of our main sponsors and has always been one of our collaborators and leaders, is the one who is to present this today with faiths that come from all over the world represented here in Northeast Ohio. We'd also like to thank the other people who made this possible, our Cleveland Cavaliers, Marcus Thomas, Bank of America, Catanese Classic Seafood, the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities, Dealer Tire, our friends at Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, Eli's Landscaping, Medical Mutual, the NRP Group, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Destination Cleveland, Dave Supermarket, Margaret Wong and Associates, our City of Cleveland, thank you, Mayor Jackson, Cuyahoga County, thank you, County Executive Butish, the City Visitor Guide, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, and WKYC Studios. It is fitting that the United Church of Christ is the presenter today and bringing all these faiths together. As we all know, the motto of the United Church of Christ comes from John 17, 2, that they may all be one. And what Welcoming Week attempts to do is to say to people who have come here from all over the world, this may not be your first home, but welcome home now. We are here to be together, to share one another, and to share with one another the greatness of our community when we come together. From 700 Prospect, a building and a mission, the United Church of Christ emanates forth from downtown Cleveland in almost 100 nations around the globe a sense that we are in this together, in these times of struggle and these times of hardship, in these times that will show that we have truly stood the test of time. Please allow me to begin our interfaith service by welcoming Rabbi Scott Rowland, the rabbi of congregation Sherry Tikva here in Cleveland, Ohio. Rabbi Scott Rowland. Hi friends, it's an honor and a pleasure to get to be with you today. Um, a, real, a real treat, I look forward to this event. Uh, uh, last year was my first time joining together and, and I want to begin ultimately with the prayer that God willing next year, we'll be able to gather together physically uh, in, in person. I want to start with just a, a brief story. It's a, a story about closeness. It's a story about intimacy. It's a story about, uh, it's a story about the shofar, the, the ram's horn that, uh, that Jewish people sound this time of year to welcome in the new year. A story attributed to the, the Baal Shem Tov, the very first uh, founder, father of, uh, of, of what we call Chassidut, um, a, an, an intense and meaningful connection with uh, everything that is good and right in our tradition. And it's a story about a king, a king who's sitting all alone, sitting on his throne and, and sighs, all I want to do is be close to my people. And he says, I know, maybe no one knows where to find me. We've all been in that position before the other faith leaders on this panel were in our, in our houses of worship and we say, where are the people? So the king decides that, that the king is going to bring the throne right up to the street where anyone can find the king. So the king brings his throne right up to the street where anyone can, can find the king and alas, no one comes. And once again, after sighing, says, all I want to do is be close to my people. I know, I'm going to create an optical illusion. I'm gonna make people see something that isn't really there. I'm gonna make them see towers and they're gonna see ramps and they're gonna see moats and gate after gate between them and me. And next to each of these imaginary gates, I will place a treasure. 
So the king creates the illusion of towers and ramps and moats and gate after gate leading up to the throne. None of it is really there, but sends out an invitation to the people and says, come, come through gate after gate, moat after moat, and you'll get the opportunity to visit me. Make it through all of these obstacles and I will be there waiting for you. And as a test, the king scatters treasures at every corner. So the people start to come. And the first one who comes happens to be a cook who passes through the first gate, but then notices a beautiful kettle of shiny new copper and beautiful oiled wood handles and picks it up and says, you know what, that's all I need and, and whistles as she walks home. The second one is a carpenter. The carpenter makes it through the second gate on the way to see the king, stops there and looks down and says, my goodness, what gorgeous solid gold hammers and picks one up and walks away singing a little song. And lastly comes a seamstress and the seamstress makes it farther than any of them before to the third gate, but stops there and looks down and my goodness, there are beautiful scissors there with diamond encrusted handles and picks up a pair of them and, and starts marching home, realizing her good fortune. On and on, the people come to visit the king and each time they stop at one of the imaginary gates and turn home with their treasure. But finally, the king's child, the king's own child hears about the invitation. This child has been away for a long time and misses the king dearly, wants to see him very much, walks past the first gate with the copper kettles and the second gate with the golden hammers and the, and the third gate with the diamond encrusted scissors and doesn't even look at any of them. Walks through all the gates with their many treasures of precious metals and jewels and the most fantastic things you've ever seen right up to the king sitting in the king's throne. And when the child turns to look back at all the gates, they disappear. The child realizes that they were never there in the first place. It was all an optical illusion. And in the end, there was actually nothing between them at all. In the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah is the day where we recrown God as king of all creation. And sometimes God seems far away. It seems like there's obstacles between us and the Holy One of Blessing. And that is why we sound the shofar. We sound the ram's horn. It helps us blast through the obstacles between us, realizing that we are closer than we imagined. We are so very close. The shofar does not blast away obstacles. It blows away illusions. Illusions are for those who weren't really there to see the king. And so my prayer as I sound the shofar to start off our, our, uh, our joyful gathering today is that as you hear the sound, all of your illusions be blown away. That we as, as, as humankind recognize that we are all closer to one another than we think, that all the obstacles in our way are just illusions. And similarly, the obstacles between ourselves and the Holy One of Blessing are also just illusions. Thank you so very much, Rabbi Roland. Thank you so much. And thank you to Congregation Sherry Tikva for sharing you and your wonderful vision. As we go on to our next presenter, it makes me think that at times like this, it is so important that we're mindful of whose land we are on. And we are on the land of ancestors who came here much before any of us or our parents or our grandparents immigrated here to the United States. It also makes me think about why we're here today. And again, if it gives me an opportunity to thank the United Church of Christ and specifically Janet Ross for helping pull all of us together and for the rabbi in leading us with the shofar as we begin in our call to prayer. Our next uh, presenters will be Pam Stropko and Greg Vonigal, ceremonial singers who bring the Four Directions song to us from their Lakota and Ojibwe native traditions. Pam and Greg, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. We're grateful to be with you all today. 
Thank you for having us be involved with the Welcoming Week 2020. We're going to sing the Four Directions song, and we start in the west, we go to the north, we go to the east, and then we go to the south. We're going to ask you all to try and um, sing a part of the song with us, and hopefully you all can see that. <laughs> it's Cheeky I.O., Cheeky I.O. That's what we would like you to participate um, in the song with us. The song is a prayer, and it's asking uh, for us to pray to him, pray to him, pray to creator. So you can also find the words in the chat box, Chikayayo. Hey, oh, hey. Thank you so much, Pam and Greg. That was absolutely beautiful. And between the shofar and your singing, uh, we are here and we are present. Uh, I wanna thank uh, at this time, uh, Ed Bell, a board member of Global Cleveland, as well as uh, Justice Dan Polster, who is on uh, this right now. We're appreciative for all the leadership we have in our community and appreciative that we have to the leaders, like the pastor for the Independence United Methodist Church, Joy Fenton Jones. We are so honored that you're with us today, Joy Fenton Jones. Thank you for your presentation that will begin now. Thank you. It's good to be with you today. Uh, I have the privilege of sharing these parallel readings. They come from the parallel sayings edited by Richard Hooper. Jesus says in the gospel according to Mark, be compassionate as your father in heaven is compassionate. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Seeing me in all living creatures, know that love for all others is love for me. The Buddha says, do not deceive anyone. Do not turn away from anyone. Never wish anyone harm. Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching, do not turn away from those 
you consider sinful and unworthy. If you have wisdom, you will try to save everyone. Here end our readings. Thank you so very much, Joy Fenton Jones. And we say at Global Cleveland, where you said, Joy Fenton Jones, do not turn away from the sinful. We say, do not turn away from those who are too often invisible. Our newcomers, our refugees, our undocumented sisters and brothers, our international students and our immigrants who've come to make Northeast Ohio the wonderful place that it is. Thank you for bringing visibility, each and every one of you. Our next presenter, from The Ohio State University, a faculty member and the executive director of the Religions for Peace in the United States of America, Dr. Tarunjit Butalia, who is also on the board of the Parliament of World's Religions North America and is, the, is on the board of the International Sea Council for Interfaith Relations. Dr. Tarunjit Butalia, we are honored that you are here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Joe. Friends, today is an auspicious week for me personally, because today, 31 years ago, is when I landed uh, in New York City with no baggage, and I slept my first night this week at the airport because I didn't want to leave my luggage. And you can tell how old I am by now because that time the airline was TWA. Some of you probably remember TWA. So it is really an honor for me, and I thought about, you know, what is it that I would want to reflect with all of you today? Several years ago, I visited the Statue of Liberty with my two daughters, who are now adults, and I read this poem that was inscribed at the bottom of the monument. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest us to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Friends, today, the Statue of Liberty must be in mourning. The promise of America expressed in that beautiful poem, the promise that all are welcome to these shores, that all can become a part of this great nation, that promise now seems doubtful to men. And in particular, the current pandemic is being used by our own government to be able to further assist in refugees as well as immigrants not coming to our great nation. Last year, as I was walking across the Ohio State University campus to teach a class, where I've been for three decades, I had a person, a student on the other side, show me half of a peace sign and say the F word and tell me to go home. Friends, in that moment, it became clear to me that the seeds of dehumanization that had been sown by our public officials had reached a complete and terrible fruition. Let me be clear, America is not his nation. And if I may quote the great poet Langston Hughes, I too am America. This nation is not owned by any one race or religion. Friends, I would like to share with you something that was written around 1942, and I would like to see if any one of you might be able to guess who wrote this. And I quote, I simply cannot build up my hopes on a foundation consisting of confusion, misery, and death. I see the world gradually being turned into a wilderness. I hear the ever approaching thunder, which will destroy us too. I can feel the sufferings of millions and yet, if I look up into the heavens, I think that it will all come all right, that this cruelty too will end and that peace and tranquility will return again. Can any of you guess who wrote this? If so, you can put a comment in the chat box. Our attendees are also well, and you can unmute and tell us that. Anybody? Yes, this was written by a 14 year old girl in Nazi Germany and Frank in the diary of a young girl. What may be even more surprising for us to know is that her family was denied refugee status by her own very country on her family being suspicion of Nazi sympathizers. If we had accepted her family as refugees, she today might have been a 90 year old woman living 
in the greater Cleveland area. We friends don't have to repeat the mistakes of the past. At this time, friends, I believe we are all African Americans. We are all Muslims. We are all Jews. We must stand together to oppose attacks because an attack on any one of us is an attack on each one of us. To protect life, we all must work together as we are only as secure as the very least amongst us. Salam, shalom, fateh, and peace. Thank you so much, Dr. Utalia, for that wonderful presentation that we too are America, as you quoted Langston Hughes. And may I just say on behalf of everyone on this call, how much we embrace you. And if we could take away the, and add the other half of the peace sign, we do so now loving you and cannot wait to do so in person, doctor. Our next speaker is Sensei Dean Williams, who is the guiding teacher of the Crooked River Zen Center here in Cleveland, Ohio. Sensei Dean Williams, welcome. Hi, Sensei. Dean Williams. Seeing here. Can you have... unmute? Dean, if you could, there you go. Thank you, Dean. You're unmuted now. Can you hear us? Okay. Sorry okay. about that. Slight technical difficulties. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you this morning. And the message I wanted to share uh, involves a very essential part of the practice of my tradition, Zen Buddhism, and really Buddhism at large, and other religions as well. Uh, and it's the Japanese term for it is gasho, and it's simply the bringing together of the palms. So when I'm on retreat, we're doing this regularly. Uh, when we enter the meditation hall in the morning, we bow, we come to our cushion, we bow to our cushion, we turn, we bow to everybody else in there. Even if you're the first one in the hall because you want to get an early start at meditation, you turn and you bow to the empty room. Just as I do at home when I do my morning meditation, I always follow the same routine always coming together, putting the palms and the hands together and bowing. These opposites coming together in, uni in unity, left and right, forming one, which is signifying an important teaching for us. The fact that all of existence depends on this coming together of unity and difference. So when we welcome people into this country from other nations, from other cultures, it enriches us in the exact same way as Gasho. You become part of our community, whether it's for a short period of time, or for a very extended period of time for some of you. Either way, there's, there's this act of gasho. And while gasho is generally seen as just being this hand gesture, obviously, if we do this enough, it starts to impact all of our life because our words are like gasho in terms of how they can bring us together to appreciate the power of language to do that. So when we speak to others, even if our hands aren't like this, we're, we're speaking out of this place of gasho and recognizing that life itself at its very root from, from, from man and woman coming together to, to give birth, to give life, and then caring for that child. So there's the, the uh, man and woman coming together in Gasho. There's the parent and child coming together in Gasho. As we uh, uh, 
enter into the, the broader community, the various stages of life, it's, it's constant gosho. We retain our individuality. That's important. That's our contribution to the community at large. But the only way we can be able to appreciate the richness that you bring is by opening ourselves up to it. So this practice of gasho is a reminder constantly that indifference, our lives are made much better by reaching out to you and bringing you into our lives and caring for you, the compassion as uh, the opening quote expressed it, that they may all be one. The only word I would change is I'd get rid of the they and say that we may all be one. It's us. And that I firmly believe. So I'd like to close just by gosho and welcome each and every one of you. Sensei Dean Williams, thank you so much for that, for that reflection that we will carry through the rest of today, the Gashao. We are very fortunate today to have Yasmin Germain Hout, the author of Compass, Finding the Way Home from the Inside Out. And Yasmin invites us to join her today in the singing of a Sufi chant. Yasmin Germain Hout. Good to be with you. Hello, everyone. So, uh, I'm still seeing Sensei as the speaker. I'm trusting that you can hear me, correct? Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna sing it once through and then I'll tell you a little bit about it, okay? So these are Arabic words and I'll tell you what they mean in a moment. It goes like this. Bismillah, Bismillah, Erachman, Erahim, Bismillah, Bismillah, Erachman, Erahim, Bismillah, Bismillah. Erachman Erahim Bismillah, Bismillah Erachman Erahim Bismillah is a phrase that begins every surah of the Quran. Beginning with remembering, remembering Gasho, remembering the full peace sign, remembering that all of these obstacles are illusions, remembering interbeing. We begin every breath, every word, every action from a place of remembering. Erachman Erachim, mercy, compassion, and the key in this word is Rahman and Rahim both have as their root phrase, Raham, which means something like womb, the creative, fertile place of beginning again. We're always able to begin again. So let's begin. If you choose to, sing along with me. If not, just listen. You can find the words are in the chat box, uh, so you'll find them there. Thank you, Janet. Yeah. Bismillah, Bismillah, Erachman, Erahim, Bismillah, Bismillah, Erachman, Erahim. Rock my hair. 
Bismillah, remembering. Bismillah, beginning from a place of remembering. Bismillah, remembering unity, the way we come together in our diversity, the way we create strength by building each other from the inside out, by remembering, by destroying the illusions that have armored us from our interconnectivity. Bismillah, Bismillah. Gratitude, Amin. Thank you so much, Yasmin, Jermaine Hout, author of Compass, Finding the Way Home from the Inside Out, Bismillah. What a beautiful, beautiful prayer. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Eileen Papalardo, a counselor here in the state of Ohio, who will teach us some movements from the spiritual practices of the dances of universal peace, Eileen Papalardo. Hello, oh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting a dance today that is inspired by Ruth St. Dennis. And um, the theme is of the dance is that it's the practice of sacred listening. Um, the, the movements will be organized in an A and B form, but mainly what's important is to know that um, those movements, they're embodying both inner listening and outer listening, which are both skills that we need in, in, in this world right now, in, in our life, um, in our world as it is, to learn to listen and to know that listening is a sacred task. It's a sacred practice. So um, the words are, uh, I will become a listening soul. We'll be singing that four times. And then um, uh, to catch the faint, clear meaning of reality. And we'll be singing that four times. I, I'm going to sing the song first, and then I'll show you some simple movements that you can do while you're sitting, or you can, or you can stand if you'd like. The, um, the song goes like this. <clears throat> I will become a listening soul. I will become a listening soul. I will become a listening soul. I will become a listening soul to catch the faint, clear meaning of reality to catch the faint clear meaning of reality to catch the faint clear meaning of reality to catch the faint clear meaning of reality and so we'll begin by um just imagining we're, we're going to be outstretching our arms like imagining that we're in a circle together holding hands. And um, we're, we're imagining that we're moving together in the community in deeper listening, first by listening to ourselves, and then by listening deeper to others, the others in the circle. And, um, and, and as we move toward a greater humanity, we are thereby deepening our connection to the divine in, in who dances with us in, in our, our everyday life and who is dancing with us. So um, I'm just gonna stand to show you some of the movements again. You can just stay seated. The first, um, the first movement will be um, moving forward for two steps and it goes like this. I will become a listening soul. So it's on the right foot and back on the right foot. And then four steps forward. I will become a listening soul. Then we're turning. I will become a listening soul. Four steps. I will become a listening soul to catch the faint clear meaning of reality, to catch the faint clear meaning of reality to catch the faint clear meaning of reality to catch the faint clear meaning of reality. We'll go through one more time. 
I will become a listening soul. 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 I catch the faint, clear meaning of reality to catch the faint, clear meaning of reality to catch the faint, clear meaning of reality to catch the faint, clear meaning of reality. Once more together. I will become a listening soul. I will become a listening soul. I mean. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that wonderful, wonderful dance and prayer. I will become a listening soul. I will be singing that all day and hopefully all year and the rest of my life. It gives me great pleasure to introduce someone known to many of us, the very Reverend Bernard J. Owens. He is our Dean of the Trinity, Trinity Episcopal Cathedral here in Cleveland, Ohio, of the Diocese of Ohio, of the Episcopal Diocese. He will invite us to share in an agape meal, also known from the Greek as a love feast, from the early church, the very Reverend Bernard Owens. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, and hello, friends. My, I, I'm going late, which means my spirit is already filled with these many gifts of song and dance and bishmillah and song from the shofar and gosho and, of course, memories of the TWA terminal at JFK, uh, which I know well and remember well and. This is a universal symbol of toil and passage for all of us, anyone who has been to JFK. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pleased to be reminded of that. And so what a pleasure to be with all of you. My gift to add to this is a plate of biscuits, which I wish you could share with me. And I'll explain it in just a moment as a part of this this love feast that sadly we cannot share to break bread together, but it, we do spiritually. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith, and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Perhaps you've heard that hymn before. I, it sounds so much better with vaulting ceilings and an organ thundering, but this is what you got, my friends, it's me. Uh, in, in our church, in our tradition, I believe this very firmly that each Sunday, each time we gather, the church is new and we are changed by those who come in for the very first time. It's a new church every Sunday. And, and in the same way, this is a new city every time someone walks in the door, just as this pan group of panelists is a new community that, that is never existed today before and will never quite exist in the same way going forward, just as we welcome each and every one of you. I think that's how God speaks to us and changes our, our communities and our cities and makes it richer. And it, it, it helps us to, uh, to be listening souls. I'll be singing that all day too, uh, because it helps us to be open, not just to letting the other, the, the immigrant, the newcomer become a part of what we've got going, but rather we all become a new community the minute that person comes in the door. The, uh, the agape meal, the love feast, is something that dates back millennia uh, and has always been a gathering where uh, beyond just our, 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 our identity as, as Christians, uh, our identity as people of faith, but rather a time to sit down around a shared meal with an opportunity to forgive one another and to hear stories and experiences that 
to be honest, we really only hear around meals. Perhaps you've had the experience where you sit down for a hard conversation where the whole point is we're going to sit down and we're going to understand each other. Um, that can be fun, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. Uh, usually it's not, it sounds like medicine that way. Um, but I want to share an experience. I'm actually kind of a newcomer, too. I moved here from North Carolina uh, about 18 months ago, and I'd be happy to tell you, any of you about North Carolina sometime. It's a magical, wonderful land uh, that is not as cold as, North, as, as Cleveland, Ohio, uh, but uh, both places have their strengths. Anyway, my, we were, uh, we, we walked, we lived near our children's school. This is going back about four years. And we were really blessed in this city. This is Greensboro, North Carolina. And in this school in particular, to have a vast population of folks who were new to the United States in, in every way that that could matter, as, uh, as immigrants, as scholars, as professionals, as people here to make a new way, um, coming from all sorts of circumstances. And, and in fact, in our, our school system in North Carolina, there were 120 languages that were spoken. Uh, and the best night of the year, hands down, everybody came to it, was International Night. And we came because it was all about the food. We went from one booth to the next, and you'd go from Sudanese food to, uh, um, to Honduran food, all the best of Central Africa and, and uh, Central America and South America and, and India and China. And it was, it was just joyful. And we showed up in the spirit of openness. We didn't care where anybody was from. Uh, it, some people were, who had been in the United States for generations wanted to share German food and, and Irish culture. Uh, it was just this wonderful open-heartedness. And in that, that type of thing is the richness of America. That type of thing is the richness of our community. And something I have just come to love about Cleveland is this is a city where this kind of welcome is in our bones. It is in our DNA. Um, what made this a great city a uh, hundred and more years ago is what continues to make it a great city. And that's you. And that's this welcome to bring, to, to, that we all come together. And the benefit is we also come together sharing our own traditions. And I came up with a biscuit because I was coming from North Carolina. Um, can any of my panelists, by the way, tell me where I can get a good biscuit in Cleveland? Feel free to take uh, un and mute because this is all about sharing, folks. We're doing this in real time. Whoever finds it first, come to the cathedral and uh, let me know, please, and we will share it. And what I'm going to do is say just a, a few prayers from, from uh, a, an agape feast where we, an agape feast where, where the idea is if we were all together, we would all be sharing and eating and bringing our own cultures. But I want to share something that, to, that was very meaningful to me because I want to be honest with you. When I came here a year and a half ago, uh, I didn't have to go through JFK to get here, but it still was, um, it's hard to leave home and take on a new home. And so wherever your heart is right now, um, I, I was just there myself not too long ago, and most of us can know, know, know a bit of it. And I'm going to share the end of a beautiful uh, blessing, John O'Donohue. It's a prayer for an exile. I know we all have those moments. And this is to remember that there will be a moment where this will become your home and we will all be uh, this community together, even in the midst of these uh, of challenging times. Now is the time to hold faithful to your dream. You understand that this is an interim time full of awkward disconnection. Gradually, you will come to find your way to friends will open doors to a new belonging. Your heart will brighten with new discovery. Your presence will unclench and find ease, letting your substance and promise be seen. Slowly, a new world will open for you. The eyes of your heart refined by this desert time, you will be free to see and celebrate the new life for which you have sacrificed everything. Friends, the beauty of a place like this is you don't have to go far 
to meet someone else or to taste the flavors of another culture. And so whether this is a blessing for your meals today, or maybe sometime this week, try something new and hold these blessings in your, in your heart. May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Let us pray. Blessed are you, loving God, creator of all that is. You bring forth bread from the earth. And on this day, you give us the bread of life that we might be companions sharing bread. As grain scattered upon the earth is gathered into one loaf, so gather your people in every place in unity and peace. Blessed are you, loving God, creator of all that is. You have blessed the earth to bring forth food to satisfy our hunger. Let this food strengthen us in the work before us. Help us to bind us one to another in fellowship and prayer. For yours is the kingdom of love now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Bernard J. Owens, the Dean of Trinity Episcopal Cathedral. In this vault of grace, all are welcome in this place. Thank you so much. Our next presenter will be Sheikh Musa Sugapong, an Islamic scholar here in Northeast Ohio to share the Sheikh's perspective. Sheikh Musa Sugapong, thank you. Good morning, friends, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this beautiful morning and allowing me to be a listening soul by going later. And listening is something which, as human beings, it's, it's actually our first mode of, of learning. And we, we listen from the very moment that we're in the womb of our mother. Before we're even born, we can hear things before we can see and before we can speak. And oftentimes, especially in our line of work, we get used to speaking. And sometimes we can speak a little too much. So it's very refreshing when we can sit back and actually listen. And I'm doing my best to listen and benefit from everyone here. And I pray that we're all able to take some sort of benefit. What I was hoping on shedding some perspective on is the Muslim outlook on immigration. And something very simple, of course, nothing too drawn out, but it is something very central in our faith. Our, our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his first revelation, when the angel Gabriel came to him in the cave of Hira, he didn't know what was taking place and he actually became terrified. And he rushed home where he found his wife, Khadija. And it was Khadija who consoled him and let him know that, don't have any fear, be reassured that you are a righteous person and a righteous man, and God would never forsake you. Come and meet my cousin. My cousin will know what to do. And this was the beauty of his wife that she actually believed in him before he believed in himself. And she was that support and that rock that was able to help him through one of the most uh, challenging moments of his life. And they would go to her cousin who was actually a convert, right? So in the Arabian Peninsula, they had predominantly a, a, an idolistic mode of worship, but he had converted to Christianity and was a follower of the prophets and scripture. And he became a scholar of the Torah and a scholar of the Bible. And when they told him what happened, he reassured him and said that the being that came to you is the same being that came to Moses and Jesus. And but now you must prepare yourself because your people are going to exile you. And Muhammad was surprised because he had no beef and no problem and no conflict with anybody. And he asked them, are they going to expel and exile me? And the cousin of his wife, whose name was Waraka Ibn Nofal, he responded and say, by saying, yes, no, 
person has ever come with a message like yours, except that they were exiled from their land. And sure enough, 13 years later, he was forced to leave his homeland and immigrate to the city north of him by the name of Medina. So he became an immigrant and a refugee. And so did the other Muslim believers that were with him in his company. And the people of Medina, they were the ones that welcomed them into their city. And this was something unprecedented because it was a very tribalistic society. So we think that as Americans, sometimes we can be a little too patriotic. All right, patriotism has nothing on tribalism, right? So uh, this was something unprecedented for them to do, but they welcomed them with open arms and they welcomed the immigrants with open arms to the extent that the Muslims during the time of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they became known as either one of two groups, the immigrants or the helpers. In Arabic, al-muhajirin wal-ansar. The companions became known as either an immigrant or, an help, uh, or a helper, and there really was no third type. And that's how the community was built, and that's how, from that moment moving forward, they were as able to establish faith in their life and in their communities. And it became such an important part of our history that the Islamic calendar is actually based on that year of immigration. So in the Islamic lunar calendar, we are currently, we just had our new year this month, and it's the year 1441, 1,441 years ago. And the first year of that calendar was not the birth of Muhammad. It wasn't the first revelation. It wasn't anything but the year he migrated and became an immigrant. So they became known as immigrants and helpers. So either you're an immigrant or you're someone helping an immigrant. And that's how amazing that was. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he used to say a very beautiful prayer where he would say, La Aisha illa Aisha al Akhira, Faghfir al Ansara wal Muhajira, that, oh God, there is no life except for the life hereafter. So forgive the helpers and forgive the immigrants. Because there's this implication that when there is an immigration involved, that there's going to be a lot of difficulty. And whenever you bear difficulty for the sake of God, it becomes a source of forgiveness. So whether you're immigrating or you help those who immigrate, there's going to be some challenges and it's going to be very difficult. And that source of difficult actually becomes a source of forgiveness. So as people of belief, we always keep the bigger picture in mind. We are not people who just limit ourselves to this world, but we know there's actually something beyond this world. And we know that nothing is ever done in vain and no difficulty is ever left unnoticed by God. Therefore, when we struggle and we strive, then we know and have firm conviction and faith that it, it will be noticed by God, even if it goes unnoticed by everybody else. So he would make this prayer, dear God, there's no life or I should say rather, the ultimate life is the life of the hereafter. Meaning if I, even if we don't get anything else and we don't get the comfort and you know, that everyone else is afforded, we know that the, the ultimate and true life is the life of the hereafter. So forgive the helpers and forgive the immigrants because they have endured a lot. And that effort and that, uh, uh, that adversity, is never, it never goes unnoticed and it's always recompensed. So I pray also that we can be among those who are helpers, especially as they come seeking, in many cases, asylum, in many cases, protection, in many cases, just a better life. And that we can be a source of helping people transition as it's very difficult to do for them and even for us as helpers. But I pray that we're all given a strength. And again, uh, thank you guys for allowing me to be a part of this morning. And I pray that it's a blessed morning for all of us. Sheikh Musa Sugapong, thank you so much for that wonderful perspective and for that prayer. We're so grateful to you, our brother. Our next presenter will be gospel singer and minister of music, Angela Lennard, who will lead us in singing before our final benediction. Angela Lennard. Good morning, everyone. So, so wonderful to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful um, meeting. 
The song I, I'd like to share with everyone and have you uh, sing with, along with me is This Little Light of Mine, a very simple but profound, profound song. We are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. We don't have to hide from each other. We don't have to stay under a bushel. We can come out. We can come out in the opening and share a light with the world. So shall we start? Mm -hmm. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Well, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, yes, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh yes, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Well, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Once more, let it shine, let it shine again. Let it shine, let it shine. Big finish, let it shine. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 That is a spiritual cup of coffee this morning, yes, Angela Lenard. Yes, All is. right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God bless you. Thank you. What an uplifting day with all these saints on this call and all, all the gifts that you've all given us. Thank you so much, Angela. It gives me a great pleasure now to introduce our benediction speaker, um, someone who is known to many of us who has led the United Church of Christ globally since 2015 renowned author, one of his recent books, Beyond Resistance, The Institutional Church in the Postmodern World, and someone who teaches me every day, as somebody who works at Global Cleveland, that the most sacred punctuation mark in the English canon is the comma. Because in the comma, God, our creator, tells us that God is still speaking. It gives me a great honor to introduce our friend and a mentor to all of us, and certainly a spiritual advisor to me, the Reverend Dr. John Dorauer, General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ for our final benediction. Reverend Doctor. Thank you, Joe. That's very kind. And thank you, Angela, for that uplifting spiritual. And thank you to all of our interfaith participants in what has been a morning of uplift, a morning of spiritual enrichment and encouragement, and a reminder that by whatever name we call our sacred, there is beauty in people of faith coming together and sharing their passion and their energy and their spiritual reserves. This has been an amazing gift to all of us. And to all of our participants on this call who are joining us, please know that no matter who you are or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here in Cleveland. And we on this call and all of the participants in this worship pledge that we will do everything in our power to make Cleveland a place that warmly welcomes you and all of the gifts that you bring with you. And as we close now our time together, as uh, we gather in this virtual space, gathered as we do from the four directions, one more time we call upon the one that we know as sacred and as holy, that light of love that glows in our hearts and that power for goodness that shapes our common consciousness. 
and by whatever name you call your sacred, we invite her now to bless us, to bless us all. And in the name of the sacred, we receive as one the blessings inherent in the exchange of love between all people of faith. In the name of our sacred, we receive as one the blessings of a shared vision of peace and salam as we commit ourselves to building a home here in Cleveland where every stranger is welcome, every person respected, every voice heard, and every soul valued. And then having been blessed in this way by each other's company, may we now go forth from this sacred space that we have created and be agents of God's shalom, distributors of Allah's love, practitioners of Gashal, repairers of the breach, and participants in the building of the beloved community. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. John Dorauer. Thank you to all the gift givers of our wonderful, beautiful morning this morning. What a way to start our welcoming week again this year. Thank you for the leadership at the United Church of Christ. I'll ask Janet if there's anything she would like to add at this time in gratitude and thanksgiving to our United Church of Christ for helping make all of this come together. Janet? Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Indeed, it was a blessing to be together today. And so indeed, go from here and share your peace and your love and your light. Let it shine. You have such gifts to bring and to share, and we all need them. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Reverend Dorauer. Thank you, everyone, for this wonderful gift. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week for Welcoming Week. I'd like to remind everyone that we have super panels coming up just shortly. Uh, tomorrow, we will have the stories we tell, the impact of lives, lived, experiences, and journalism with Amani Abraham, Homa Bash, Maya Belay, Janet Cho, and Sia Neokor, all women, all women of color, talking about their experience, some of them as immigrants, reporting the news. It is so important that we listen to one another, as we heard from the wonderful, wonderful uh, representative from the Islamic faith, how the first act is listening. I'd like to thank again our Cleveland Cavaliers, Marcus Thomas, Bank of America, Katniss Classic Seafood, the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities, Dealer Tire, the Metropolitan Bar Association of Cleveland, Eli's Landscaping, Medical Mutual, the NRP Group, Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Destination Cleveland, Dave's Supermarkets, Margaret Wong and Associates, the City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, the City Visitor Guide, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, WKYC Studios, and the United Church of Christ. The United Church of Christ, for helping bring us all together and for sponsoring this wonderful event. Shalom, peace everyone. Thank you and have a great day.